Okay. I was trying to figure out what slides to show. I mean, when I said World's Fair Fanatic, it's kind of fitting, because I have uh, about 28,000 pictures of the two World's Fairs. I figured, you know, how can you pick out which ones you want? So if I do this, if I change slides every 10 seconds, we'll be out of here in three and a quarter days. <laughs> the doors are locked, this is performance art. <laughs> to work here. All right, the 39 World's Fair was a major, major activity for the city of New York. It's hard for us to realize today, for folks that weren't there, about how startling an event this was when you consider the Depression years and how bad things had been in the city and the country as a whole. So now, all of a sudden, they come up with this idea for the 1939-1940 World's Fair in New York, and it was really a wonderland. I'm an engineer by trade, I think, in ones and zeros and that sort of thing. But I look at pictures of the 39 World's Fair, and I just see a thing of beauty. The, the styling of the buildings, the artwork, uh, the, the entire thing to me is just a, a remarkable sort of uh, event, and I wish I had been there. Now, as folks may know, the uh, try my little laser pointer here, the Trilon and Perisphere, the uh, symbols of the fair, were situated where the Unisphere sits today. So there's a lot of similarity between the 39 and 64 World's Fair as far as the physical layout. That's not a surprise, because when the 39 Fair ended, they didn't have the money to tear out all the streets and the plumbing and the electricity and everything, bury it into the ground, leave it there, and then 25 years later, thank goodness, it was there for the next fair. The fellow here in the top hat is a guy named Grover Whalen. He was the president of the 39 World's Fair. He was New York's official greeter. You can imagine what a great job he had. Any dignitary came to town, he got to take the, the picture with him, shake their hand, uh, be a, a, the big shot, wine him and dine him. He was a police commissioner in New York, he had all sorts of jobs, and he ended up being in charge of the 1939 World's Fair. He was an ultimate showman. He did a wonderful job of putting the city on the map, telling everybody how great the city was, how great the fair was. It unfortunately didn't make a lot of money uh, during the time he was there, so he wasn't back in 1940. But Grover Whalen, uh, the reason we're all here today, it's funny how these things work, that Grover hadn't built his fair, Moses wouldn't have built the next one. The Long Island Railroad, big way people got here back in uh, 1939 because not as many people own cars as today. Uh, big, again, a big difference. Everybody, especially in LA where I live today, everybody has a car or a bunch of them in the driveway, you race around. 39, this was a major impact, uh, a way to get into the fair. And it brought you into the same spot that the train station brings you in today, but at that time it looked very different as you can see. This was called Bowling Green. Big fountain in the center, all the, uh, the streets radiating off in the same sort of pattern that we have uh, today for the fair. One of my favorite exhibits of the fair is thinking about this one. It's a full-size steam locomotive running at full speed. What is it, maybe six feet away from the people? <laughs> Pre-OSHA. <laughs> it's on a set of rollers. It's going, the wheels are churning, the steam's coming out, it's making all the noise, everything is going crazy, and the people are able to stand there and look at it. Wonderful design. This train was designed by the same guy that redesigned the Coke bottle, the classic Coke bottle. The only trouble was they found out after the World's Fair it was too big to fit around the curves on most of the tracks in the United States. So they realized, well, it looked great at the fair, ran great on a turntable, but it didn't do so well on the railroad, and they only built the one of them. But that's the Pennsylvania Railroad S1. 39 World's Fair had a tremendous uh, international presence. Countries came from around the world because the Depression had impacted them. They were also trying to get out of it. Everybody was trying to convince people in the United States come and visit us for the tourist dollars, come and invest in our cities, invest in our natural resources. And I've just picked a couple of pictures at random out that I just love the style. And sometimes it's also kind of interesting to look at the dress and uh, see how stylish everybody was back then, compared to if you go to, uh, say, Disneyland today and see how folks are dressed. This was the USSR Pavilion, and it was a bit of a controversy you know, because um, the war was coming. Everybody knew what was, things were going on. Communism was a, a big debate on whether it was going to succeed or not succeed. But the, uh, the fellow they have here uh, up on the top became known as the bronze, I'm sorry, the bronze strap hanger. Big statue, and there was a big argument about how tall he was going to be and anything in the United States was going to have bigger, taller. Lots of controversy went on in 1939 they were here. 1940 that was demolished to the ground, replaced by a smaller thing called the American Commons and uh, Russia did not participate. 
What Russia did do was take the pavilion back to Russia uh, and reuse it over there, and they've had a habit of doing that with their various pavilions at, uh, at World's Fairs. And this one's ironic. This is the, uh, the Japanese pavilion. And it's a little hard to read the sign here, but it's the Flame of Friendship. And it's talking about the eternal friendship between America and Japan. <laughs> 18 months later, right? <laughs> so very ironic. World's Fair was also a fun spot. This is the parachute jump, which is now on Coney Island. And these people are doing something that is a little different. They're getting married. They're on the parachute jump. Here's the minister, uh, and then the bride is right behind, and they had a special seat. And you could have made arrangements to go on the parachute jump and have your wedding out there. So uh, I'm sure that, you know, most of us don't forget our weddings. I'm sure nobody that had their, their services on the, on the parachute jump ever forgot that one. My dad had gone to the World's Fair as a kid, and he liked to tell the story about, you know, typical teenage guy, big and, you know, he's brave and nothing's going to scare him. And they got up to the top of the parachute jump, and there was a ring you had to pull. Well, he didn't realize the ring didn't do anything. It was just, like, tied to the framework. But he pulled on it, and nothing happened. And he pulled on it, and nothing happened. And he was convinced he was stuck up there. And then when they dropped him, he wasn't ready for it. So my dad was too young to get married on it, but he said he was probably as scared as that guy was. <laughs> George Washington statue, huge. If we look at the sizes compared to the musicians at the bottom, put things in perspective, he's just around where the uh, fountains of the fairs are, the fountains that would jump the water on it. And the, uh, the United States Pavilion way in the back is where the bell system was in 64. George was huge, and at the end of 60, uh, sorry, 1940, George was demolished. Almost every piece of statuary and sculpture and everything else for the 1939-40 World's Fair is gone because it was all built out of plaster of Paris, gypsum, and other uh, materials that just didn't last the, uh, the, the you know, telling of time. Which is unfortunate because, I, again, I, I'm not, my wife can tell you, I, she's an artist, I'm not. Uh, she is amazed at how much I enjoy some of these. The fellow that did Prometheus for the uh, uh, skating rink in Rockefeller Center, did the same thing with these uh, figures here. Just wonderful piece of work. And unfortunately, all we have is time. It's in memories of them. Now, Time Machine, a lot of World's Fair enthusiasts would make a beeline here to the souvenir stand, I'm sure. After being outside in the hot sun, I don't know, I might go for a frozen custard myself. But uh, the World's Fair was just absolutely full of souvenirs. We have a little video coming up a, a little while with some uh, images of some of those. Fair was also gorgeous in color. Now, 1939 was really the first World's Fair to exhibit color photography and to take advantage of it. Kodak actually gave out free rolls of film at their pavilion trying to encourage people to take color photography. If you look at like the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, you don't find color pictures of it, or if you do, they're hand tinted. But the World's Fair, after looking at so many pictures in black and white, when I finally started seeing color shots of it, you just think, wow, this must have been really something. The right National Cash Register, by the way, if you see up at the top, it says attendance yesterday, and they cleverly put the uh, attendance count up there on, on the, uh, the cash register. Trial on a Parisphere again, flower beds, just a gorgeous day out in Flushing Meadows, and uh, not too crowded that particular day. But again, the statues, they, they were just everywhere. This is over in the transportation area, and I think this one was called Speed, and just one statue after another after another. That's one thing, when I look at the 64 World's Fair, there were very few pieces of art there, and I didn't understand the ones that were there. These, at least, I can kind of relate to. Again, more statues, fountains. This is the Firestone Pavilion, where you had this. This is a thrilling pavilion. You could go in, this is no joke, you could spend the time and watch them make a tire. I cannot imagine how it must have smelled, but it must have been a fun pavilion to actually watch it make a tire. Nighttime. You can only imagine how gorgeous the fair must have been at, uh, at nighttime. Um, they would do things with the Parisphere, light it up and put different slogans on it. They would light it up in red, white, and blue for the 4th of July. A uh, famous shot people may have seen of it as a giant pumpkin for uh, uh, Halloween. Uh, it made a great billboard. They had special projectors. They could put things out on the, uh, the side of it. Again, another sculpture, this is a, a sundial done by the same fellow that did Paul Manship that did the smaller figures and did Prometheus. Just a beautiful, beautiful picture from my view of the fair. Unfortunately, the fair got old. You can see here pieces of it falling off. By 1940, 
It was in sad shape, things were coming down, but we have to realize it was a temporary fair. These buildings were built to be temporary, and they only lasted so long. And by 1940, uh, they had lost money, people were ready to turn their back on it, so they tore the fair down, and they didn't have money to rip it all out. So you see things like the, uh, the symbols here on the, uh, the the uh, compass that went around the, the perisphere is still there. The roads, we're now I think right about this spot right here. All sorts of things just left behind because they didn't have money. And there were some really weird things, like this picture was taken two years after the fair closed. This is the Poland Pavilion. For whatever reason, they didn't tear down the Poland Pavilion, they didn't tear down the Japanese Pavilion, they didn't tear a few of them down, and they just sat here in the weeds. This is Flushing Meadows Corona Park about 1953. Not real attractive. The city didn't have any money. They didn't have any particular way to bring the park back to life. So we had decaying uh, sidewalks and potholes. And it, if you see pictures of the park then, it was not a place you'd want to bring your family. But we flash forward to uh, the 60s and a fellow named Robert Koppel. Now you thought I was going to say Robert Moses, didn't you? Robert Koppel was a New York City businessman in 1958, sitting at dinner with his daughter. And they were talking about the Brussels World's Fair and world peace and that. And uh, he started thinking about World's Fairs. Why don't we have one in New York? And from that simple dinnertime conversation became the 64 World's Fair. Uh, it's, so it's kind of interesting to think that, you know, a small conversation he had, if he and his daughter weren't having that nice dinner in 1958, I doubt we'd all be here today. But he brought in Robert Moses. Uh, everybody probably knows Robert. Robert then promptly got rid of Robert Koppel because he didn't want the competition. So, so much, you know, the old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. But Robert Moses, New York's master builder, uh, people love him or hate him, particularly depends if you're from the Bronx or not. But Robert Moses was the driving force behind the World's Fair. He got it built. You know, Robert Moses had a lot of wrong things with him. He probably should have gotten it built and retired and not gotten some battles with the press that he did. But he did get the World's Fair open. This was when they were taking the uh, effort to bury the river, which uh, went across the ground, the Flushing River, and put it underground to create the uh, pool of industry that's uh, out there now, sort of stagnant. But let's take a look at a happy time when the 64 World's Fair was open. By the way, since I've moved to LA, I've become really disappointed in you guys in New York. What did you do with Shea Stadium? <laughs> I actually get back here about five, six times a year, and uh, I, I saw it go up and I saw it come down. And you know, it's when you see something like that happen, you start saying, "I guess I am getting old." But think about a day—a beautiful day in, in Flushing, people coming in from the subway station, and they're going to go to the fair. And the fair it was big. That's one of the things that it's, it's really hard for people to go to some place like Disneyland or Disney World today and realize just how big this piece of property is. When I came back here in 2008 to take pictures for the second book that we did and have a chapter on before and after pictures, what the park was like then and what it's like now, walked all around trying to match up pictures and everything, and it took me an entire day. And that's without anybody in front of me pushing a stroller, without having to wait on line for two hours for General Motors. I mean, to just walk around this park is just an immense undertaking, as uh, any of you who have done it will probably, probably know. The Unisphere, obviously, a gorgeous uh, centerpiece. It's still there. Thank goodness the city's taking care of it. This was taken from the, uh, the upper state uh, levels of the, uh, the observation deck of the New York State Pavilion. The uh, building back here, the United States Pavilion, unfortunately sat here in the park for a few years and was torn down. You can see the uh, Singer Ball, which is now uh, part of it is being used for tennis and is, I guess, going to be torn down and remodeled. But this is where the whole Arthur Ashe uh, tennis complex is today. Down below, for the folks who came from the other side of the river, here's your pavilion from New Jersey. The New England States pavilions are up here. It was, uh, it was a wonderful time. The fair was big. To get around it, there were several ways. One of the great ways was to take a ride here on the uh, glider rides from Greyhound. And uh, tractors, they would race around the, uh, the fair. Some of them stopped at certain parts. Others gave uh, tour guide rides and explained what you were seeing as you went around. But they were a, a very convenient way to get around. If you were more affluent, you could rent a escorter. And the, uh, anybody here actually ride in one of the escorters during the fair? Uh, you had a better budget than I did. We were working. <laughs> yeah, you were working. That's great. The expense accounts, huh? 
The escorters were little motorized taxis. You uh, got to pay the privilege of the driver taking it around. The problem was if you wanted to go see a pavilion and then it was a two and a half hour wait, you told the driver to keep the meter running, you, uh, you needed an expense account. A few of these have now shown up uh, over the years, and uh, one was just an American Restoration TV show. A couple people have gotten restored, and we're trying to twist a few arms and see if we can get uh, people to take a ride around here in the park on them. The real good way, of course, was to go for a ride in a Hertz stroller. Remember the ad campaign, let Hertz put you in the driver's seat? It's supposed to say that on the side of the stroller. It's they used about the cheapest decals of the world. By the end of the fair, I don't think anybody knew who was providing the strollers anymore. Only one of all the strollers you see in all these pictures, only one of them has ever turned up. We're trying to figure out where the other thousands are sitting in some warehouse waiting for, uh, for to be discovered for Eagle. <coughs> Fair also gave us a number of other things. These luminaire street lights, they're, uh, they're big. They're, the people that have not seen one of them up close don't realize how big these things were. The cubes were about, uh, Gary, how big were they? About 18 inches? 16 inches. Each one of these little squares, 16, and you start multiplying that, going across the other way. They came in all sorts of colors, shapes, geometries. Uh, they're really a great thing. Some of the folks here actually have them in their, uh, their collections. When I told my wife I was thinking about getting one of these, she started saying things I won't repeat. <laughs> the uh, only piece of statuary at the fair, we got a mouse here somewhere. <coughs> The rocket thrower is still out there today. He's been refurbished uh, recently, and uh, again, a great symbol of the fair. It appears on the postage stamps and other uh, memorabilia. One of the things I got a kick out of was the serpentine phone booths. Uh, after I, uh, I graduated from high school, I went to college, and I helped put myself through college at the phone company, and we would talk about these and picture phones and all the other odds and ends, but. You know, so Clark Kent would have done too well with uh, one of these phone booths, but it looks like they are. <laughs> you also had the family phone booth. You went inside, and it was something that nobody ever heard of, called a speaker phone. You went in, sat down, dropped your quarter in, pushed the button, and realized you didn't know what to say to the people on the other side, because as soon as you'd start talking, they couldn't hear you, or vice versa. Sort of like, you know, Skype today. Uh, but. <laughs> It was, it was great fun. My uh, aunt worked for the phone company, so we got to make free phone calls. And, and you realize after a while, when you call people saying, I'm at the World's Fair and you're not, they didn't like you anymore. So, other things people might re recognize, the brass rail snack bars. They were these giant balloon figures, uh, kept inflated by a small fan that ran and uh, kept inflated. But they were great for somebody like me, because they also sold souvenirs. So if you came in, you got something to eat, and you had some money left over, you could take home what we collectors these days affectionately call landfill. <laughs> and there was everything you could imagine in the way of souvenirs. You know, I, I look at things like this and say, boy, imagine getting your dad to buy you something like that. That's the good part. Now you've got to carry that around for the next 10 hours. You know? it's, uh, it's kind of daunting, but people just love the souvenirs. There's catalogs showing all the stuff that was made. I mean, it's just... You could outfit yourself from head to toe, and, and daytime wear, and nighttime wear, everything, is, and clothing, and housewares, and, and just the, the, the list goes on and on and on. You also had things that were nicer or more upscale than souvenirs. This is the Vatican Pavilion. They made a major coup for the World's Fair of bringing the Pieta statue over from uh, Italy. Every time somebody gives me a hard time about being from New York, about you know how uncouth we are and everything, I said, hey, we didn't break the statue. They did when they got it back home. You also had a lot of other international pavilions. The Austria Pavilion, after the fair, became a ski lodge upstate New York. Unfortunately, it burned down about two years ago, I think now. The stone wall here is the Japanese Pavilion. After the fair, it was donated to a college, and the stones are still sitting in weeds 50 years later, waiting to be put back together. You had the Indonesia Pavilion, which was open for the 64 season, but because of politics between the U.S. and Indonesia, it sat empty for 65. And it was kind of a sad situation, because it was a beautiful pavilion, wonderful exhibits and everything inside, but you walked by and it was just a sawhorse, New York City Police Department closed, and it kind of made you realize that we weren't there quite yet with the theme of peace through understanding. You also had this situation, a lot of international countries did not participate in the World's Fair because of the Bureau of International Expositions. It's the 
group that governs and licenses World's Fairs. And they have all sorts of rules on how often they can be, how big they can be. Uh, and New York managed to find every rule in the book and break every single one of them. You can't be open for more than one year. New York said, no, we're going to do it for two. Okay. You can't charge the international exhibitors rent. No, nope, no, nope, we're, we're going to charge rent all right. Well, they, they just went on and on. The worst thing was that they can't have World's Fairs within a certain year span. They've got to have a gap between them. Robert Moses just said, oh, one in Seattle, that's too little, nobody's going to care. He went and made some really nasty speeches about the bunch of idiots over in Paris, and their response was, nobody better ever go and put anything into New York World's Fair if you ever want to have a World's Fair in your country. So you had exhibits here. This is the American Israel Pavilion. Most of the exhibits, the international exhibits of the World's Fair were actually sponsored by com companies from those countries. So they were very commercial concerns. They did have, you know, tourism uh, components of it. They did have some stuff on the history or whatever. But they were really run by the countries behind them. And that was really a, a big downfall for the 64 World's Fair was that if Moses had tried to make nice with the guys, like in 39, they had the same issues, can't go for two years. Well, if you notice all the merchandise for everything from the 1939 World's Fair, it says the 1939 World's Fair. It doesn't say 1939-40 World's Fair. Well, they knew in 39 they were going to be around in 40, but they didn't want to get into it with the BIE, so they just made it the 39 World's Fair. Moses had all sorts of options and things he could have done, but he just decided he had never lost a battle in New York. Of course, he had not met the uh, Loyal and Sound Bridge folks at that point. But he, uh, he tried to push through and he didn't get it. There were a number of uh, other countries that came in. Jordan here had a wonderful pavilion. They unfortunately didn't like their neighbors at the American Israel Pavilion. And there were all sorts of controversies, protest marches, uh, all sorts of problems going back and forth. And you, you read the fair correspondence and you start thinking maybe they should have realized how big, remember how big the fair when we saw it overhead? Maybe they should have put a little bit more space between them, but they didn't do that. Pavilion Denmark, real stark. For people that have uh, Danish-American furniture, they would have felt right here at the pavilion, home at the pavilion. After the World's Fair, somebody bought this, took it to Connecticut, and I think he's still planning on putting it back together. The uh, China Pavilion, there was no mainland China as far as the World's Fair was concerned. This was the Republic of China Pavilion, built in China on Taiwan, brought over here, reassembled at the fair. Absolutely gorgeous building. And I had a wonderful Chinese restaurant uh, down below that became a very popular spot. Another really popular pavilion was this one, Thailand. Thailand was built again over in Thailand, brought here, without the gold leaf on it. It's, it's actually covered in real 24 karat gold leaf. And I have pictures the week before the fair opened of the guys up there applying it. And I, I think I would have been tempted to say, one for you, one for me, you know, take some of it home. But they were doing so much work on it, they ran out of gold leaf. And they were running everywhere they could to finish and get more of it to put it together. After this fair ended, they took it apart, and it was up in Expo 67 in Montreal for several years. And it was really a kick, because I went up to college not too far from, uh, from Montreal, went in, into the Expo 67, not knowing what to expect, turned around, and boy, I talk about deja vu. It, uh, that's just like the one in New York. It was actually, they expanded it for Expo 67, but it was... It was fun to see an old friend again. The 1933-34 World's Fair had a Belgian village. When you look at a picture of that World's Fair at their uh, Belgian village, and you look at ours, you'd swear they were the exact same thing because the guy used the exact same blueprints. The only difference is the pictures of this one are in color. But the, the World's Fair, the Belgian village was not finished for the World's Fair. It didn't open until very near the end of the, the 64 season. And there was another pavilion that was not in good shape, the World of Food. That wasn't ready to open. Robert Moses tore down the World of Food because it was right near the main entrance and he didn't want everybody seeing all of the unfinished pavilion. He happened to like the guy that ran this one, so he let this guy keep building and they finally opened it up. It's an interesting story here, this bell tower. After the uh, fair ended, you can imagine they had to tear all this down. And uh, people were coming with all sorts of schemes. How do we rip this down? How do we tear it down? A bunch of researchers wanted to come and shake this thing to pieces to simulate an earthquake to try to decide about <coughs> earthquake structures and whether or not New York City could survive an earthquake. So they came and they put all these machines to shake the buildings and measure how much they shook from side to side. But they got here the day after the fair to begin their work and you can see these bells up here. They weren't there anymore. 
The World's Fair ended that night. Somebody came, cut the bells down, dropped them on the ground, took them in a truck, and melted them down somewhere. So, free enterprise. Oh, okay. Travelers Insurance. How many people have one of those really rare red records? <laughs> For people who don't know what I'm laughing about, you go on eBay, and you got to get a kick. Because everybody finds one of these in Mom's dresser and puts up really rare red record. They force these things on you. I mean, I, I literally swear they came out of the pavilion and made you take them. You know, I mean, I've got so many of them at home. After the fair, they had so many. You, know, you wrote to the company, they mailed you. You went there, exhibited the museum. There's there was a hire. They give them to you. They come out everywhere, and I constantly get emails from people. Hi, I'm standing about World's Fairs. And is this record worth a lot of money? It's uh, it's hard to tell them no, but uh, it was a great little souvenir. One of my favorite, favorite pavilions from the fair, because I was very lucky, one of my high school buddies' sister worked at the Bell System. So we'd get in the car, and it was the first time I'd ever been in a convertible and Mustang riding to the fair, and she was good looking, and she could talk the guards into letting us into the fair for free most times. It was also nice because on a really hot day, we could go in through the VIP entrance and go right up to the top of the line, ride it nonstop, and not have to be out in the hot sun and everything else. But uh, it was a great pavilion, and as I said, that I think led me working for the phone company. One little detail here that folks might appreciate is this little walkway here. That's how they came and filled up all the firework launchers in the, uh, the lagoon for the nightly fireworks show. They're really ingenious. This whole system is connected out to the bay, so it's tidal. So if you want to go and fill the firework projectors, you stop the water from coming in on one side to let it flow out of the other at low tide. The walkway pops up out of the water as of magic. You run across it, you fill up the firework dispensers, you go back, you open the gate, the tides come in, fill it up, and you don't see the little walkway. So it's kind of an ingenious little sort of way that they, they did that. This was the equitable life uh, system. They had this meter here about the population of the United States. As a kid, I was really amazed by that because it kept changing, and I said, boy, people keep dying on a regular schedule. I mean, it's very, very precise how that happens. It started making me worry. But, uh, you know, a, a number of us were all convinced they had, you know, people, yeah, yeah, I just had a baby in this hospital. Nope, he just died, and they were changing the numbers. Little did I know about you know, statistics and analysis and stuff like that. It was just a projection. So if Uncle Floyd kicked the bucket, the number didn't go down for you. <laughs> DuPont's Wonderful World of Chemistry, wonderful exhibit. Again, they, they would show you how they make uh, different plastics and chemicals and do all these things that folks take for granted today. It was a wonderful exhibit, and it was a really nice multimedia show where the audience would uh, be watching somebody with a flower you know, on the stage and they would hand it to a performer on a piece of film who would do something with it and hand it off to another person, a live performer. They would actually you know, seemingly pass things between the 3D people on the stage, the 2D people on the films. It was a very clever presentation indeed. One of the favorites, General Electric. Uh, again, one of the big reasons I went to work for Disney. I was telling somebody earlier today, it's part of the way you can date pictures of the World's Fair is by what changed. And one of the big things that changed out here was in 64, this was a vacant field, it was a pavilion that never got built, and the lines for the General Electric were everywhere. I mean, the lines you were just out for the uh, uh, New York State Pavilion, that was GE every single day of the World's Fair. So they came by in 65 and put these uh, covered shades up there to make life a little bit uh, easier for folks. But this pavilion and the other Disney pavilions had an amazing influence on Disney. Because Disney was not sure that their brand of uh, entertainment would carry to the East Coast. They, you know, Walt was a very small town guy. Uh, everybody around him knew that Disneyland worked. But would Disneyland really sell to the East Coast crowd? He had been thinking about it, looking at it, and then Robert Moses thing came up and said, Hey, I'll give you a couple million dollars to try it out. Very, uh, very good deal for Walt. So they came in, built a Carousel of Progress, Small World, Lincoln, Ford and found out, hey, this stuff did work. Uh, it was interesting because it was a fellow named C.B. Wood who had built Freedom Land. Anybody been at Freedom Land? Yeah. Freedom Land, I, I worked with C.B. at Warner Brothers, and uh, I went up to him one day and asked about Freedom Land, and he wanted to know if I was one of his creditors there to sue him, and I said, no, I just went there a lot as a kid, but we had an awful lot of talk about how tough it is to make a go of a theme park type experience in New York, because you can't operate one of these things 24 you know, hours a day, seven days a week, but mostly you can't do it 12 months a year. 
people are not going to stand on that sort of line in February in New York, and they found that out with Freedom Land. That also was not lost in Walt, and that's how they ended up down in, the, in Florida. Another wonderful exhibit, the IBM Pavilion. You got on the people wall, it raised you up into the theater. You got to see presentations on amazing projections that people would actually have computers they could access. You know, a lot of people contact me and they say the 64 World's Fair was a real dud, wasn't it? Well, no, it wasn't to me. I said, well, what did it get right? You know, well, it sure got computers right, didn't it? In 1964, at the World's Fair, you could walk up to a terminal. They wouldn't have laptops, obviously, or anything like that. But you could sit down and say, here's my birthday, and it would tell you everything famous that happened on that birthday. You could say, what's the, uh, the recipe for, you know, banana cream pie? You could get that printed out. What's the routing between here and Pittsburgh? They had all these databases. You know, pretty much with canned sort of applications and that. But it was really the first time that I could, or many other people, could actually sit at a computer, type something in, and look at it as it came back and gave you the answer. It was, it was really kind of remarkable. That's the big impact. I mean, I, I came out of here just going, wow, and started looking for computer classes. And uh, IBM was a great one. Also, people might recognize that this was shaped to recognize the IBM Selectric typewriter ball. So, big, big change there. It was, you know, everybody with their typing classes. My mother was a typing teacher, and she still is horrified to see me type. Uh, it's just like you don't like to take driving lessons from your dad, you don't want to take typing lessons from your mom. But uh, another way you can find things that change in the, uh, the World's Fair, in the, in the pictures, was all these little letters of IBM are great, except at nighttime, they don't light up. So I have pictures of guys standing here in scaffolds and ladders chiseling out some of the IBMs and putting ones that light up at night. Because otherwise when the fair, you know, the nighttime came, IBM lost all their advertising value. So how are we doing? Folks still with us? Yes. Want to see a few more? Yes. I appreciate your uh, indulging me. I mean, uh, I'm giving a talk like this down at Disney World in November. I was saying to my, my daughter, I said, hey, wow, this, these tickets for this thing are going for $1,200 a piece. Imagine that, people paying to listen to me. He goes, I pay you that to shut up, so. <laughs> One of my favorite, favorite pavilions, Kodak. Uh, so sad to see what's happened with Kodak in recent years. They, you know, the, the weight of digital it just killed them. But these pictures up here, everybody thought they were giant slides. They weren't, they were giant prints. You can see here in the tray the lights that shine on these and bounced off. Even in the daytime, they were lit up. Giant pictures, and it's really amazing. They had contests from around the, uh, the country for different photographers to submit their, their work to be shown here. And then down below, they had all sorts of exhibits. Some of them really deadly dull about you know chemicals used to make plastic and stuff like that. But I get a lot of emails from people about, do you have a picture of this, do you have a picture of that, you know, and I got a letter from one woman that was really kind of fun, she said, I, uh, I was in a picture that I think was shown on the Kodak Pavilion, and I'm jumping rope and skipping rope on a beach and, uh, out in California, and I never made it to the fair, do you have a copy of that? And I said, oh sure, and ten minutes later she had it. And it was kind of funny because she said, oh, geez, I didn't realize I was wearing a red dress. You know, my favorite color is purple. So five minutes later, she had it in purple. So <laughs> thank God for Photoshop, my best friend. But Kodak was a wonderful spot. I mean, uh, they had uh, all sorts of exhibits there. By the way, there's no truth that room of those giant pictures that were taken with the giant Instamatic. <laughs> but uh, they had uh, our friend here would uh, go around and uh, take pose for pictures. And this is Emma Kelly, Jr. He also carried it around, posed for uh, pictures, and talked to people because up to this period of time, everybody had the film where you had to put in the camera and then turn the little dial and turn it and turn it and turn it and finally would say, oh, oh, and then they finally turn it one. Oh, I finally got the picture one. And now Instamatics came by. Stick in the cartridge, push the button, and you're, you're ready to go. So a lot of photographers make fun of the 126 Instamatic format. I figure I'd rather have one of those pictures than no picture. Another pavilion that is still with us to part, the Johnson Wax Golden Rondell, is still out in Racine, Wisconsin. They're still showing the film To Be Alive. It, was a, it actually won an Academy Award. Besides being shown here, they raced it out, stuck it in the theater, cat, uh, uh, classified it for the Academy Awards, and it won an Academy Award. You can still go and 50 years later see that, uh, that film today. NCR Pavilion was a very interesting pavilion from an architectural point of view. Because up to this point in time, most pavilions or most buildings were built with big columns that would march along and hold up the ceiling. The guys here put these columns up 
and steel cables and that would hold up the ceiling. So they had tremendous amount of floor space within the pavilion to put exhibits in that. And so you take these things for granted when you go to a, a facility today and you're not having a column every six feet or 12 feet or whatever. They really changed the design of architecture, the fact that you could do this building supported from the roof by these columns as opposed to uh, you know, big pillars. The Tower of the Four Winds, how many people recognize that? It's a Raleigh Crump's invention for, for Disney. It was their fourth pavilion. They, uh, they came by and they were working like crazy on the others. And then uh, Walt came in one day and said, um, I got an idea for a little boat ride. And you think about that pavilion, I'm going to be really nice and not have us do a sing-along of the song. <laughs> but one of the big kicks for me, I, I got to be honest, was when I went to work for Disney meeting the Sherman brothers who wrote this and having them over at my house and doing a song fest and singing this song and my daughter and her friends were just, that's the guy that wrote that song. So. Dick Sherman's still with us. We like to, you know, kid him that at sometimes I curse him because I can't get it out of my head. But uh, you know, small world was a wonderful thing. But think about the guys that built this pavilion. You got two big soda companies, Coke and Pepsi, right? How many people remember the Coke Pavilion? That's about more than I expected. I mean, this was unfortunately not a great, uh, great pavilion. And if you come back for the uh, seven o'clock talk, I'm doing totally different pictures. I have some of the interior shots of it. But you can imagine the poor guys at Coke. You build this pavilion, and you look over and see what the guys got over at Pepsi. I bet there was a big turnover in the ad department in 1964. You also had the Seven Up Pavilion, and you could get sandwiches from around the world. You had towers of all sorts. This was the Tower of Light, and it had a giant beam of a light going up. I was one of the Boy Scouts here at the fair, and not in that picture, but it's one of my favorite pictures of the fair, because working here as a kid was a great thing. You got to stand around and tell people what this particular thing was, and don't do that. And then you got really important jobs, like please tell them don't touch the eagle in front of the uh, uh, United States Pavilion, because everybody kept breaking the lights underneath when they went up to get their picture taken. So you, you're really doing well when you're trying to tell somebody, don't do that, and the guy doesn't speak the language you do, and he's about eight feet taller than you. But you got the red jacket, and amazing, in 1964, people listened. Another line of different sort. Anybody notice anything about this line? No men, plural. It was, you could go in and the women could line up and see how they would look. You stuck your face on a screen, and you say, I wonder what I'd be like as a brunette, with a page boy or a bob or whatever. And they actually had a computer that would predict your hair color for you. The men, meanwhile, got to sit up here, have a cigarette, and wait around. You know, what I think they should have done is put a sports bar up there or something. It could have been real popular. This was a pavilion that, to me, still describes, you know, I, I look at it, what were they thinking? In case you get tired, you could go to a Simmons Rest alcove and take a nap. I understand they were well supervised. Otherwise, it would be, I'm sure, the World's Fair version of the Mile High Club. But I cannot imagine that I would pay my money to go to the World's Fair, be looking around, and all the stuff going, you know, I need a nap. <laughs> Pavilion, of course, we all love. It looked really great then, and I have high hopes we're going to see it someday looking this good again. This level. Yeah, this level was the VIP level, where important people came, politicians and the rest. The rest of us got to go up here if we were really lucky and could afford the uh, elevator ride. But look at it in its glory. I mean, this pavilion was a real eye-opener. Uh, people, I get called all the time by people wanting quotes about the World's Fair and that. I was talking to a newspaper yesterday, and they said, don't you think, you know, it's past its time and it should come down? And I said, now, what if they had done the same thing with the High Line? I mean, any people take a walk on the High Line in Manhattan? Oh, yeah. It's a wonderful experience. I mean, it's, it's just great. And if they get this pavilion open again, to think that you could have concerts in here, art shows, you know, whether Boy Scouts do their shows, or the karate clubs, or anything, the, to, once it's down and it's a soccer field, it's never going back up. So if any of you folks live in this area and, you know, can support with the politicians, thank God the current administration seems to have more of a... Uh, you know, thought process and some of the past ones did, if we can save it, it will be a wonderful, uh, wonderful aspect. The uh, New York City Pavilion, I really encourage people, I mean, I, I've come back, like I said, I live in LA, I've moved out there in 76, but I come back here all the time. I always know I'm back home when I see that pavilion, and it, it really makes me feel good to see Mitch and his crew and Johnny and all the others painting it, and again, anything you guys can do, a letter never hurts to the powers that be. 
The panorama's still over there in New York City Pavilion. You can't ride the, uh, the helicopter ride anymore, but you can sure take a look at it. The Illinois Pavilion had uh, picture, uh, Mr. Lincoln, wonderful figure, audio animatronics. And it's interesting because there's hardly any pictures in existence of Abraham Lincoln figure at the World's Fair. Almost every single one you see is actually from Disneyland. Because at Disney, you had the guys at the studio thought everybody at Disneyland was taking the pictures. They thought everybody at the Imagineering division was taking the pictures. They had hardly anything out in their own catalog out there. So Disney usually comes to me and asks for pictures. Well, from an amateur point of view, Back in 1964, before the show started, the, they would make an announcement, no flash photography, please. And people obeyed the rule. <laughs> Darn them. I mean, so I, I've got a bunch of really bad pictures of Mr. Lincoln, very blurry and that sort of thing, but there's hardly any good pictures of Lincoln from, uh, from there. And almost every one you see, somebody says, oh, I got one. It turns out to be Disneyland. Long Island Railroad. Uh, great, great shot. This train is still available out on Long Island. It was uh, after the fair, it went to the Grumman facility as a picnic uh, train for their, their kids. It's uh, been restored and it's out on Long Island about two years ago. I, I went out there and I was 12 years old again and I loved it. So if you get a chance to go out and visit the museum, it's out in Riverhead, go uh, ride the train and uh, it, you'll, you'll be 12 years old again. It's, uh, it was a lot of fun. You also had other states participating in the fair. This fellow uh, just died about two years ago, and about a month from now, the state of Montana is having a celebration about the fact that they came to the World's Fair. They did a kind of unique thing. You can't really see it in this picture, but they put a whole bunch of exhibits on train cars, brought them out here, parked them on a train siding, and then uh, you know people came in. What's really kind of funny, this thing back here, it's a buffalo mounted on a golf cart. And they would drive around the, the, the fairgrounds and people would follow them like the Pied Piper back to the, uh, uh, the site. This had actually been used at the Montana State Fair before the fair, and amazingly, they still have it. So I don't know if they still drive around with it or not. And after 50 years, I hate to see the shape the fellow is in, but all sorts of pictures of people staring at it as it goes by, because it's not something you see every day, a, a buffalo go past. <laughs> It was also a big time for the fair, the space age. It was really big. If you had anything to do with the space age, you, you did it. You put your sign up or whatever. In the case of Missouri, people say, how come there's a mercury capsule in front of the Missouri Pavilion? Well, that's where a major component of the manufacturing was done for that. You had others over at the, uh, the space park. Inside, they had uh, displays about the upcoming Gemini program. They also had a replica of uh, Lindbergh's plane. But for kids like me growing up, one of the real kicks of this thing was they actually had real astronauts come here to the fair. And to go and meet guys like Gordon Cooper, oh my goodness, or Scott Carpenter, shake their hands. I mean, it was the sort of thing where uh, it, you don't forget it. Years later, I had the pleasure of working with guys like Gordon, and I would talk to him about it. He said, oh, you know, he remembered the fair real well, had a great time coming back. And it was really, again, a, a great childhood memory that, you know, your heroes, you just didn't see them on TV. You could actually come here, meet them, and talk to them at the fair. It was really wonderful. This is a replica of the 1939 uh, Westinghouse time capsule. It has a, a glass uh, insert so you could see everything in there. And during the fair, you could put your name in a book that they then microfilm and they dropped out in 5,000 years. I, how many of you planning on being there for that? <laughs> I keep thinking, 5,000 years. If you read about almost any time capsule around, they lose them after 10. You know, it's like, well, I know it was over there somewhere, but Joe retired when he buried it. You know, the fact that 5,000 years from now they're going to go find this, I keep thinking about if I dug it up and sold it on eBay, who'd miss it, right? <laughs> I also look at it, see how much empty space is in this section up there? If that's how much it's settled in 25 years, I think in about 5,000 years it should have come packed into about that, so good luck for it. But uh, that's why Westinghouse ended up over in the state and federal area, because they had been in this area in 1939. They weren't going to move the time capsule, so instead of being with all the other giants of industry, they ended up across from New York State. This is one of my favorite ideas of the fair. Fish and get a trout. You could go here to the beautiful pavilion from Minnesota. You could walk in and see all this stuff. And they actually had a little river here. You could get in a canoe and ride around in a canoe. And you could catch a trout. So you can think about July, August or so, about 9 o'clock in the morning. You stop and you pick up your trout. About 3 o'clock, everybody in your family sure know where you were because all they had to do was take a big sniff. It's, it's things like that. You start thinking, what were they thinking? You know, catch a trout. 
Fair also had a number of things that are no longer with us. Eastern Airlines was the uh, official airline that you could actually come in here, check your suitcase, and they would take it out to the airport for you and uh, make your flight. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, didn't do them any good for staying around. We're almost done. Almost done, promise. One of the great things from the fair, I understand, because I was only 12, is that they had it was beer, and it was beer, and it was beer. And boy, I don't have pictures of people enjoying themselves on a hot day in Flushing Meadows. But you also see this little sign here, Kodak Picture Spot. As you collect pictures of the fair, you start wondering why there's so many of the same thing over and over and over again. Because everybody came by and said, well, don't know why I need a picture of the Lone Brow sign, but Kodak says I do, so off I go. So you get lots of pictures of the same thing over and over. With, again, I have about 20, maybe 22,000 pictures of this fair. You look for things and you see the same thing over and over. And Bill Young and I were commiserating about how do you pick, you know, your favorite pictures of the book. It's like, oh, how do you, you know, which is your favorite child? You know, this one's got to go, bye Johnny, didn't like you. And you look for certain things and you realize others you don't have. And there was one picture I could never find. It was the Macy's All-Stars Leisureama Home. And it's because it looked like a suburban tract home. And this idea was you would go to the Macy's uh, store and say, give me a number seven. And they would build you a house they put everything in it. Your toothbrush, the little cup the toothbrush went in, your toothpaste, everything from A to Z. You could buy the entire house at Macy's. And they actually had a few people buy them, put them out in Long Island, Fire Island, that area. But for the most part, people walking around the ferry, you would take pictures of the New York State pavilions that looked weird, or you take a picture of the brass rail. But why would you take a picture of this, you know, tract home sitting in the middle of the World's Fair? So a fellow named Albert Fisher, who uh, was the director of TV and film for the fair, it was asking me to digitize his collection for him. Ah, oh, sure. Okay, Albert, and another thousand slides, nothing to do. And looking through, and oh my God, it's Macy's. And my wife was like, you have a big smile. And trying to explain to her, yeah, nerd, what, what can I tell you? <laughs> U.S. Royal Tire. People enjoy writing that. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful thing. I, you know, Ferris wheels were invented for World's Fair. World's Fairs have to have, you know, a Ferris wheel to, to really be official, just like they seem to have a monorail. But what a stroke of genius, putting it into a tire and going around like that. It was, uh, that tire is still in Detroit, uh, advertising tires. The ride hasn't been in it since the fair, but a wonderful piece of marketing. And for our friends at the Port Authority, again, I put the show on. Thank you very much. The Port Authority is amazing because you can actually go and take a helicopter ride on the fair. You could fly here from the city go for the fair like the Beatles did, fly back out, or you come, go up to the top and ride around. I can only imagine today if you said, let's have a World's Fair, put it in Flushings, and what, you know, I'm going to give helicopter rides all day long, all night long, just how happy the people from Queens would be to have those <laughs> helicopters overhead. But it's a, it's a great pavilion. It's really good that it's uh, still with us. Another one that's still with us, the Hall of Science, it was not completed until very late in the, in the fair. Uh, had all sorts of funding issues, but because it was going to always be a permanent pavilion, they let it continue. It was a huge problem though, because they were constructing it in the middle of the fair. So they constantly had to have people walking around. You know, if you think about the, the logistics of building something like this, but doing it as 300,000 people walk around, it's amazing they got the thing done. Ford Pavilion, yeah. interesting thing here about the license plates. They originally went off and got license plates from all the different states, put them on the cars, and realized they had a problem because people got on line and said, I want to wait for that one, I'm from there. So it was bad enough that everybody wanted to ride on a Mustang, but it was also bad enough that everybody said, oh, I'm from Nevada, I want to ride on that. So the license plates didn't last that long. It was, it was a great idea that they had gotten them and everything. But the, uh, the, the Ford Pavilion was wonderful. It was a great exhibit. After the pavilion ended, they uh, took the cars, put the engines in them, the drivetrains, and sold them off. And there's all sorts of people in line that are bragging about, I have a car that you know, 52 million people sat in. You know? It's bad enough you ride from Hertz these days if you look at the miles in the car, but imagine 52 million people have taken a ride in your car. Chrysler had different cars of different kind. They had the world's largest motor, supposed to be a one million horsepower engine. Uh, they also had cars sitting out here in the fountains. General Motors, the, the big king of the fair, they were the leader in 1939 uh, admissions and the, also the same for 1964. As I mentioned, things like the shade, again, you can uh, 
determine pictures, the dates of the thing, because these lines were insane. They're, they just thought when they built a the thing, everybody would go in. Well, now they started going up and down, up and down, and down here and around there. Because the sun hit there so much, they finally started trying to make it more comfortable for people. But that's how popular the fair was. These lines were insane, as anybody who went there can remember on certain days. The, uh, the Sinclair dinosaurs, they were built upstate New York. Brought down here on a barge, a famous uh, photo. I had the, the pleasure of seeing them at the studio when I was up there with my Boy Scout troop. One of our leaders says, hey, you know what guy's building some dinosaurs? You want to go see him? Yeah, what 12-year-old kid doesn't want to go see a dinosaur? So we went and saw them and, and brought them down. Over here, anybody know what they're doing in this area over here? Making little dinosaurs, right. Those are the Moldorama machines, which we're trying to do something with Moldorama, so keep your fingers crossed. So. But uh, you can wander around, see the dinosaurs, and take home your little brontosauruses, pack them away comfortably, and then sell them for a fortune on eBay. <laughs> Is it still there or not? How many people want to take a bet? All sorts of debate. The guy came out, Mr. Swayze built his underground home. It was, again, the, the, the uh, Cold War. Constant air raid drills in college, in uh, elementary school, duck and cover. You know, if you get under your desk, that will protect you from the atomic bomb. <laughs> or you could go into the underground home. And the underground home was another one very hard to find pictures of, because in 1964, the film was very slow, needed a lot of light. People would go down there, take pictures, and you would get something six inches away, and the rest of the house just doesn't show. But there's a big debate when the, the fair ended that they rip it all out, or they leave any behind. How many people saw the CSI New York episode with it? it a friend of mine, Trey Callaway, we were sitting around talking about silly things and everything, and uh, we'd start talking about the underground world home, and a little light bulb went off Trey's head. Trey happens to be a producer of the show and a writer, and then a couple months later, there's the underground world home. His villain lived in it, and everything still works, still have lava lamps and all the rest of it. I'm convinced if anything is down there, it's about, uh, you know, a, a wonderful display of 50 years of rust. But it was an underground home, uh, the, you know, you could uh, ride out the atomic bomb and come back up and see what was left. This was one of the unfortunate parts of the fair, it was a flop. Um, they had a number of shows at the World's Fair that did not last a long period of time because they, this was a, a big musical tribute, uh, tribute to Broadway. To Broadway with Love, great songs, great dancing, the, the soundtrack's available now on, on, on a DVD, a CD, it's, it sounds great, but why would you come to Queens to pay admission to get into the fair, to stand in the line to go see a Broadway show when Broadway is just that away? So this did not last long, it sunk the Texas pavilions, you also had the uh, show here at the uh, Aquacade building, the uh, amphitheater. This one did not last long. This one was great because the uh, Bell Rocket Man would come in, fly across the stage on the rocket pack, and totally deafen everybody so you didn't hear the rest of the show. <laughs> one of the things that was more successful, one of the politicians mentioned it today, was the dolphin show in Florida. Because every theme park you go to today has a dolphin, right? You know, it's almost mandatory. You gotta have this, you gotta have that, you gotta have a dolphin. 1964, the only dolphin anybody in New York had seen was on Flip TV with Flipper. To come in and see this, it was a free show, and it was, you know, I think they had about nine times a day. It was a real, real eye-opener. I know this is one of the things, I tell you, living in L.A. and our traffic in L.A., I keep going, why the hell don't we have monorails? I mean, it was, you just think about this thing, you can put them down in the middle of the highway, ride around, have a great time. Of course, in an earthquake, mm, maybe not so good. But the AMF monorail was just a, a real kick, and uh, it, it just rode around the amusement area. Disney had proposed building one that would have been left here permanently in the park and take pe people around, but it was too expensive. They went with the AMF system. After the fair, these cars got taken out to Texas. There was talk about putting them at one of the airports in Texas. They were later used as a kid's uh, playhouse, and they've disappeared from sight since then. But another thing, every theme park has to have it. Lot Flume Ride, where was the first one in the US? The 64 World's Fair. So they're having a great time, aren't they? But we're getting near the end, so hopefully people aren't running to the doors yet. They are locked with guards. But this is the chapter of the book that Bill Young really convinced me on the last book that we had to do a whole section on the fair in color at night. And I'm really glad that we did because it seems to be one that gets the most reaction out of people. The fair at night was a really special place. You walked around all day and it was crowded, it was hot and everything. 
But when the sun went down, thank goodness it was cooler, the crowds went home, it was a much more relaxed place. The music was playing. I was fortunate a number of years ago to uh, buy the set of tapes that were used for the, uh, the fireworks show every night. And I also ended up with other tapes that for the background music that played on the loudspeakers during the fair. And if you ever want to recreate the 4th of July, go to my website, worldsfairphotos.com. Look for it, download it for free, have a 4th of July extravaganza in your backyard. But the fair every night was just a wonderful spot. You had things like GM, it changed colors, the lights played, it would be red, it would be green, bluish, white. It was just, it was so many different things going on. You had pavilions like the Philippine Pavilion, not the most striking of pavilions during the day. At night, just a real spectacular view. Again, the New York State Pavilion. Hopefully someday we're going to be able to go back up top and ride one of those little sky street elevators. Kodak was, uh, again, everybody thought giant slides, they were prints. This, by the way, was a, a happy accident. Whoever was supposed to be there for the fair decided that they couldn't build their pavilion, so we ended up with the Garden of Meditation. And uh, it's not too, uh, too bad in a looking place, Phil, or is it? Sadly, the New York, uh, sorry, United States Pavilion is no longer with us, but this is kind of interesting. These uh, panels here, plastic panels, had a space of a few feet behind them, a wall with light bulbs that they were lit up from. They didn't have to use spotlights all around the pavilion shining on it. This pavilion shone from the outside in, and it was just a spectacular, wonderful thing to, to see at night. It was also, the entire pavilion was held on these uh, small four feet here, uh, and it was built by a bridge company, as were a number of the other pavilions, like the Bell System Pavilion, because there were giant spans of steel, and it was better to build giant spans of steel than bridge companies. GE at night, this uh, dome would swirl around. The computers that made that dome swirl around would probably be from out, out there to about here. And that's all they did was make the lights go. I mean, it's, it's just amazing when you think how technology has changed over time. All the stuff to make the audio animatronic figures work was totally different. But they had this giant programmable logic system that they could make different patterns as the lights go back and forth and chase themselves. Tower of light at night. The fountains of the fairs, uh, back in the, the bell system again, every night this thing going, pulsating the music, the fireworks coming out of it. It was just a, a wonderful way to, uh, to spend, the, uh, spend the night. Unfortunately, the fair ended. This is the day after the gates closed. And this is, uh, oh, let's see if anybody can guess. Anybody know what the thing this was? Alaska. Alaska. Very good. People must have bought the book. <laughs> It's still a nice day, it's only 75 degrees, they could have kept the fair going, but by the time the fair was, at this point, everybody lost so much money, I think they were ready to pack up and go home. Some pavilions wasted no time. This is literally one day after the fair ended. It's just astonishing. Meanwhile, over at the Disney Small World Pavilion, they were putting the boats on trucks the same day, because they were going to open it up at Disney World, as, uh, sorry, Disneyland as fast as they could. Other pavilions just came down by the pieces, and every now and then bits and pieces of them show up on eBay or different parts of it, but unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end. This is the chapter that always makes me sad. But luckily, the, the number of the things survived. Uh, this happened to be taken on the day the park was opened back in 1967, turned back to the uh, this people of New York. The uh, little elevator that could was parked there for many years, as we know, and didn't... Uh, didn't get much use, but that's our look at the World's Fair.